thank you for this day, for your Son and for your Holy Spirit, God. We thank you that you've allowed us to gather in your name, God. Thank you, God, that you have brought us here tonight, Lord. Father, I pray for your anointing upon me this evening, God, upon every woman in this place. Father, I need you. I'm, I'm only a mouthpiece, God. So I need your anointing that I can preach with your authority and your fire, God. And that tonight, God, that lives would be transformed, God. That every mind and heart would understand and receive the direction, the word that you're giving us, God, as we're on a relentless pursuit, God. As we are chasing hard after you, God. Father, we need you, God. We need you more than ever, God. So I pray tonight that the supernatural would be released, my God. And that we would not go out the same way that we came in, God. Oh, we give you all the glory and we give you all the honor and all the praise because you alone are worthy of that, my God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give him a strong, strong, strong praise like the one he's worthy of. He's the one that saved you, picked you up, cleaned you up, turned your life around. He's worthy of all the glory. Hallelujah. Come on, I want you to shout hallelujah. For saving me at the age of 19 years old when I was facing a life sentence of 25 years to life. God shut that door and opened up the door to the women's home. Oh man, we serve a faithful God, amen? He's a good God. You know, I just want to testify about how good he is because the arresting officer was a gang task force officer named Officer Calderon and that was actually my sister who was that arresting officer, and now she's saved, and she's here with me tonight. I'm telling you, my God is in the miracle working business. I said, my God is in the miracle working business. There's nothing impossible for my God. I just want to share a little bit about my God. There's no chain, no barrier, no wall, no mountain, no valley, no ocean. situations are impossible but when an ex you know everything and a cop can ride up together to a preaching to a service you know, I just want to let you know a little bit about my who God my God is I want to brag on him a little bit I want to boast in the Lord a little bit nothing is impossible he's a good God amen he's a good God and I'm so grateful because my daughter, two of my daughters are with me and they love the Lord. And that's, a, that's like the greatest thing for a mama when her children serve God. Amen. My daughter Mariah is going to, uh, she was in Panama for six months. And recently she goes, man, I know I'm called to go back and I want to go to this crusade. And she believed God and he made a way in like two days. And now she's going to the crusade. And I'm telling you, you just got to step out by faith. Our God is good mighty and he's here tonight amen i want to thank god for the san diego church thank you so much for inviting me sister georgina pastor al this is such a privilege to stand on the man of god's pulpit it's very humbling it's an honor and it's just tremendous to see the work that god is doing here in san diego to see the move that's taking place, the power that's happening, and the precious pastor's wives that are here tonight, and I know there's other women that are visiting, and you know, God, I believe that God has a word, amen, I believe that, I believe that he spoke to my heart, and that he's gonna, uh, he's gonna bring somebody through tonight, amen, he's gonna get you across to the other side, amen, 
Praise the Lord. I'm going to go ahead and, and get started. I want to thank the worship team. You guys are amazing. You know, I love the worship. I, I love to hear uh, I was uh, new songs tonight that I haven't heard before. And I'm like, oh, man, we need to sing those songs. You know, because really there's, there's a lot of declaration in these songs we were singing tonight. We're declaring how mighty God is and how great he is. Amen. Tonight, excuse me. You know, I'm blessed to be um, able to be used of God, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the Mother Church. I don't want to th forget to thank God for Pastor Sonny and Sister Kim. That's where my husband and I are right now. And originally, I'm from San Jose, and my spiritual father's Pastor Ed, and, and my spiritual mama is Sister Mitzi. And I'm, I'm just grateful to be a daughter of EJM, amen, to be uh, able to be used by God, amen. Thank you, Jesus. If you have your Bibles, go with me to 1 Samuel. And I'm going to be sharing with you tonight out of the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I'm going to read, amen. I'm going to go ahead and read because there's a few verses. And now some of these, I'm Mexican, not Hebrew, so I might not get some of these names right, okay? So we're just going to like blah, blah, flow through them like I know what I'm saying, all right? Amen. The word of God says there was a certain man from Ramatham, a Sufite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf. Okay, see what I mean? <laughs> An Ephraimite. He had two wives. Say two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion. Turn to your sister and tell her double portion. To Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Amen. You could take your seats this evening. This portion of scripture, when we read it, it's it's when we read about the life of, of Hannah, you know, she was a very key person in the books of first and second Samuel. In first Samuel, here the verse we read, it says that there was a certain man from the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Elkanah, and he had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. The fact that the Bible names her first could signify that she was Elkanah's first wife. Yet we see that the Bible also tells us that his other wife, now we don't do that no more, okay, but that his other wife, Peninnah, had children, but Hannah had none. The word none in this scripture, it means to be nothing. It means that you don't even exist. It also meant incurable. It meant fatherless, as if God, her father, was not with her. Okay, you got to stay with me in this story, amen? You know, because to not have children in this time and age meant that you were somehow cursed by God. And this is how the world viewed her. The world viewed her as being incurable. The world viewed her as being cursed by God because she had no children. But that wasn't the, the fact. That wasn't the truth here. In fact, uh, this woman, one thing about her is that she did not allow her physical barrenness, her bare situation, to become her condition. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about tonight. Don't let, you know, the situation that you're in become your condition. Don't ever let your situation become your condition, ever. Situations are meant to be changed. Conditions condemn and imprison us. She could have just sat back and said, hey, well, this is, this is what God has, the hand he's dealt me. My womb is closed. I will not have children. I'm just going to just forget it. But she didn't allow that to settle in her mind because she was a woman that was on a relentless pursuit. She was a woman on a mission, and she believed that her God was greater than that. Her condition could have easily sentenced her to a life of condemnation. 
to a life of misery. She was barren. It meant that she didn't even exist. When you look at that word and it says she had none, no children. It meant she was incurable. Imagine being looked at like that. Now, I know a few of us might have been looked at like that before we came to the things of the Lord. It's like she don't even exist. People forgot your name, girl. They forgot you existed. They looked at you like you were nobody. You were fatherless. To be nothing. Incurable. But God was with her. And he was in the midst of her situation. And guess what? She knew it. That's key. You have to know that God is with you. You cannot ever forget that God is with you. You can't, oh, God, where are you? You left me. No, God is right there. <clears throat> God will never leave us nor forsake us. Now, this doesn't mean that she didn't struggle, that she didn't hurt, that she wasn't lonely, lonely that she didn't feel the barrenness of her womb being closed, but it was quite the contrary. She was in a lot of pain. She was hurting. She was broken. She felt humiliated and ridiculed because she had no children. Look at what the word of God says in verse 4. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peninnah. Portions of the meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters. So can you imagine Hannah watching Peninnah with all her sons and daughters coming up to her husband and receiving portions of meat but then it says but to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb <clears throat> he didn't feel sorry for her that's not why he gave her a double portion he did not pity her there was something spiritual that was going on here and you got to understand that, that this was a spiritual matter that was taking place. When the Bible tells us that Elkanah would give portions to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, because, Lord, you know, he closed his womb, her womb. When we look at that, he gave her a double portion for a specific reason, and that's my first point. He gave her a double portion. When we read that she received a double portion, we tend to get excited. Don't you ever get excited when you go, ooh, the double portion. Let's see how excited you are after this message about the double portion. Oh, God, I want a double portion. Give me a double portion, God. Do you know what you are asking for when you ask for a double portion? Listen, it, it, we get excited like she's receiving some kind of justice because Elkanah is going to give her a double portion that what he gave to Peninnah. People always think that, oh, yeah, the double portion. I'm so excited to receive this double portion. But some want the double portion without knowing the true price that the double portion will cost. And that's why relentless turns into, well, I'm tired, from relentless to retired. Because we just, we just ah, you know, I thought I wanted the double portion. Well, the double portion looked good until I had to pay a price for it. The double portion looked good until I had to actually work for it. What you thought it was going to fall into your lap? It was just going to come down from heaven? The clouds were going to open? No, it don't work like that. We have to work. We have to labor. We have to believe that God has called us, that he's with us, and that there is a mission upon our lives. In the King James Version, it reads like this, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved her. Now listen to the word worthy. Uh, worthy is another word for double, okay? But it actually means forbearing, and forbearing means to be patient, or self-controlled when subject to annoyance or provocation. I hope you're catching this. To, re to have the double portion, to receive the worthy portion, meant you were going to be made subject to a few things. You were going to have to go through some situations where you were going to have to be patient and self-controlled when subject to annoyance or provocation. Now, if you had road rage on the way here, I don't know if you can handle the double portion. If you get mad when spiritual mama has to give you a little spank, I don't know if you can actually handle this double portion. 
Because this says, for me to give you a worthy portion, you're going to have to go through some things. You're going to have to learn how to be self-controlled. When you want to say something, you're going to have to bite your lip. When you want to act a certain way, you're going to have to remember that you're a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. See, when we read that Elkanah gave Hannah a double portion, we might think, oh, he gave her more meat. This don't have anything to do with meat. It has nothing to do with the carnal. And when we look at it, we might think, oh, he gave her double meat. What was Hannah going to do with all that meat? <laughs> Penina, it said all her sons and daughters. What was Hannah going to do with all that meat? That's not what it's talking about. We think of the physical, but actually, when you study it, he actually gave her a smaller portion when it came to the physical, the meat. He gave her a smaller portion because she had no children. When the Bible is speaking of this, he, that he gave her a double portion, it's talking about in the spirit. Her situation had nothing to do with the carnal. And I'm here to let you know tonight, my sister, the situation that you're in has nothing to do with the carnal. It has nothing to do with the physical. It is a spiritual matter. It's kingdom business, and that means that God's going to take care of it, that he's going to intercede on your behalf. It had everything to do with the spiritual. It had to do with the double portion that was being poured into her cup. Guess what? God wants to outpour the double portion into our cups, but he wants to make sure that you and I are going to be able to handle the double portion that he wants to give to us. He wants to make sure that we're going to be able to be those patient, self-controlled women when the enemy comes pounding on us, when the enemy's pounding our husbands or our children or our finances. God wants to see what you and I are really made of. Are we just about the talk and just about them being loud about wanting the double portion, but then we can't handle it when it comes, when he fills the cup and we say, oh, I don't want to drink from this cup, Lord. I didn't know it was going to be like this. I didn't know the double portion tasted like this. I thought the double portion tasted like the front row. I thought the double portion tasted like a title. And the Lord said, no, the double portion is bitter sometimes. It's hard. It ain't sweet like honey. Oh, but I want the double portion. Okay, we'll talk after. Because the double portion was assigned to her cup. We all have a cup that's been assigned to us. This is a cup of life that she, and she drank from that cup again and again and again. You don't think it was a bitter taste in her mouth? You don't think it was hard for her when she saw, you know, Penina pregnant again and then again and then again and then again and giving her husband sons and daughters and she couldn't give him not one child? Oh, that's a hard cup to drink from. Everything that we are looking for is not going to show up in a nice little box with a pretty little ribbon. Here's your double portion, daughter. Now open it up and enjoy it. It's not going to come like that, my sister. The double portion, it's going to show up, and it's not going to be in a pretty little box with a pretty little ribbon. Oh, all oh nice. It's going to show up sometimes through the person closest to you. It's going to show up through the least, to, to the person you least expected it to show up through. Who do you think was right there with Pen and Ah? They were close. They shared a husband. You don't get more close than that as women. Hello. They were close. They were back to back. They were around each other 24-7. The double portion showed up on Hannah's door, and guess what? It had a name. Her name was Penina. That was the double portion, and guess what? You and I just might get a Penina knocking on our door. Here I am. <laughs> you thought I was going to show up like this and like that, but I'm right here. I'm here to test your integrity. I'm here to test your character. I'm here to test to see what a good little Christian woman you are. Let's see how self-controlled you are when I'm pounding on you and I'm attacking you and I'm coming against you. Let's see if you're going to be able to, to whisper you know, to the Lord in those moments, God, I need you right now. Oh, Penn and Al's coming, girls. Now, she ain't here tonight. Don't worry. Ain't the one next to you. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not. My second point is that Hannah, she had a rival. 
Nobody here has a rival? Then you're not maybe in battle. Because, man, a woman in battle, especially on, you know why the word relentless? Think about it. Just the word alone, relentless, makes me feel a little tired. Like, oh, my God. I picture myself having to fight through some things and press through some things. I pictured the enemy putting some pen and nails in my way to stop, try to stop me from getting to my blessing. Hannah had a rival, and her name was Peninnah. Listen to what the word says in verse 6. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Huh? Double portion. This went on year after year. You're stressing about the sister that gave you a headache because she didn't want to do children's ministry. I'm talking year after year. Hannah had a rival who constantly, it was her goal in life to provoke and irritate Hannah. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat, provoking her in order to irritate her. That's what the word of God says. I didn't make it up. The word of God says that Hannah, that Hannah had a rival. And that the rival, even, look at, even when Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, Peninnah was even in the house of the Lord. Oh, maybe she is here after all. I don't know. But, I mean, hopefully she ain't. <laughs> but it says that even when she went to the house of the Lord, that Peninnah was there. And that she would provoke Hannah to the point that Hannah would weep. She wouldn't even eat. Now, I don't believe Hannah wept because she was weak. I believe Hannah wept because she was strong in the Lord. I believe Hannah wept because she knew it's better for me to follow my knees and weep and cry out to God than to give in to Peninnah. Than to give in to her provoking and her irritating me. I'd rather give in to the Lord. That's the cup of humility. That's the cup of surrenderance. That, my friend, is the double portion. That's being able to handle it. And not just handle it, but you handle it well. You can handle the double portion well. You know that the word provoke derives from a, a, a word meaning that she had to be so self-controlled when subject to annoyance and provocation, being provoked. It meant that, that uh, Hannah's rival, Peninnah, used words that were, the words that she used against her meant like there were words that could have, that led to uh, uh, Peninnah wanting to kill Hannah. We're not talking about like a little, a little beef. We're not talking about just, you know, a, a, a little going back and forth. We're talking about a provoking, a murderous thought in Peninnah's mind to take Hannah out. She didn't want Hannah to continue on and believe in God and remain on this relentless pursuit. She wanted to knock her off course. She wanted to take her out of the game. That's why you've been going through some things. That's why you've been in trial. That's why you've been in battle. Because the pen and nods of this world are coming and they're coming hard. They don't want you to get to women's convention. They don't want you to get there and hear a word from God. They don't want you to fulfill your pledge so we can knock that wall down and many more souls can come in. The pen and nods of this world want to provoke you and irritate you to the point that they kill your spirit spirit but you gotta be like Hannah you gotta be a woman of prayer a woman that says no I'll bow my knee to God I'll weep I will fast I will do whatever I gotta do but pen and I, you're not gonna take me out it's gonna take a whole lot more than your words and you pounding on me it's gonna take a lot more than that because I'm a woman of prayer see pen and I hated Hannah you know why? Because Hannah was Elkanah's favorite wife. She was his first wife. Some commentators say that he only married Peninnah so he could, she could have children to give to his first wife. So you can imagine Peninnah's thoughts knowing that Elkanah didn't even love her. The Bible doesn't say he loved her. He simply fulfilled the duty to her as a husband and gave her meat for her and her children. It doesn't even say that he gave her meat for her and for their sons and daughters. It says for her and her sons and daughters. He didn't love her. 
He didn't love her. He married her for one reason, so that she could give children to Hannah. But apparently she didn't even do that because they were still separate. It says that he took care of Peninnah. In this time, women didn't share a tent with their husbands. So Elkanah had a tent, Peninnah had a tent, and Hannah had her tent. They all lived separately. Imagine Hannah in her tent all alone, in there weeping, broken before the Lord, hearing Peninnah with her children and hearing the sound of laughter, and hearing newborn babies cry, and all she can do is stay on her knees and say, God, I know that you are a God of miracles. Listen, tonight, if you just stay on your knees before God, before his presence, your miracle will come. But you got to pray. You got to believe. You got to stand firm. You can't just show up to church and think it's going to fall in your lap. You can't come to church just to get fed on Sunday morning. You got to eat of God every single day. In the morning when you get up, in the afternoon, at night, when you come to church, you shouldn't come all starving, you know, waiting for a little nugget to be thrown your way. You should come and say, God, I'm full, but I need more of you. I've been with you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday's the grand buffet. But some come in starving. Some come in with the little crumbs that they held on to from Sunday. If she held on to crumbs, she wouldn't have got the promise. She would have never, ever achieved what God promised her but some just you know nibble on this sermon all week long let me nibble on the word that pastor gave all week long let me make it last until next Sunday I saw you're spiritually malnourished because you expect that everything has to happen on Sunday no homegirl's got to happen at your house it's got to happen behind your closed doors. It's got to happen when you roll out of bed. You want to decide if your makeup is more important than your time with God. Oh, I know I went there. Yes, I did. You want to look all cute showing up to work and everywhere you're going. But if we put a spiritual mirror, what you look like? Huh? What does it look like? A prayerless woman or a praying woman? A woman of the word or a woman that only knows Well, Jesus wept? John 3, 16, what do you know about your master, your savior, your healer, your deliverer, the one that can do anything? Pen and, you know that Pen and all, her name meant pearl? It meant precious stone. She had an opportunity. She could have been somebody great. Instead of being Hannah's rival, she could have been Hannah's partner. She could have said, Hannah, I'll share my children with you. Hannah, you're my sister. I'll love you. Hannah, come on. Let's go in there and let's pray together. Because I know the joy of a child. I know the joy of birthing a life. Hannah, I'll fast with you. Hannah, I'll partner with you. She was so disturbed and caught up with what God was doing in Hannah's life that she missed her opportunity. Listen, don't try to be somebody you're not. Stop being caught up with somebody else's walk with God. Stop tripping white favors on them. Stop worrying about what's going on in their life. Instead of being all caught up and disturbed and upset about it, rejoice. Thank the Lord for it. And watch God begin to bless you. Watch God begin to outpour. Watch the windows of heaven and blessings will pour out that you will not be able to contain them. But instead, we miss it because we're caught up. We're caught up with everything else that's going on, and we miss the double portion for ourselves. Her name meant pearl, a precious stone. Instead, she's called a rival in the word of God. No other woman is called a rival in the word of God. <coughs> he even named her so we would know exactly who she was. Hannah wasn't even competing with her. She was her sister. Sometimes you think in the church that things are going on and that person's not even competing against you. If anything, Hannah was in a different realm of battle. She was in the fight for her life. Her fight wasn't against Peninnah. See, Hannah, she walked, talked, and lived in another world, and Peninnah had no idea about it because Hannah lived in a spiritual realm. 
See, that's why sometimes you can't connect with somebody because you're in the flesh. You're just, you're thinking carnal-minded. Oh, look at her getting double portions of the meat, and I'm over here. Huh? I, I, you know, look at her. I'm over here doing all the work, and she gets all the recognition and all the blessings. No, nah, she's just been on her knees. She's been talking to God. She don't care about who recognizes her. She don't care about no titles. She don't nobody need nobody, sh you know, making her look all good. She just cares about how she looks before the Lord. Sometimes we care more how we look in front of people than how we look before God. Hannah was in another world. See, Hannah lived in the land of prayer and supplication, in the land of suffering, and some don't want to suffer. So you won't, cross, you won't cross over to the other side. You go, oh, no, I'm good from right here. I'll just check things out from over here. I don't, I'm not going to cross over to the other side. I've seen the price that that cost Hannah. No, see, if we're going to do anything great for God, we need to move into the land of supplication, into the land of prayer. We need to be willing to go into the land of suffering. Nobody wants to suffer. Just give me the glory. Just let me shine. But I don't want to pay a price for that shine. I don't want to pay a price. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to go through anything. I just want the double portion. Just give me the double portion. No, it's not going to work like that. It won't work like that. God loves you too much to give you the double portion because it will take you out. The double portion will just take you right out. He knows that if we're not praying and we're not seeking the throne, how can we receive the double portion? We won't understand suffering. We'll get angry and we'll get mad at God. We won't understand times of tribulation. Oh, but I thought you were a good God. We won't understand times of famine. Yes, Christians go through times of famine. Oh, but God, you said you were the provider, and now I'm here with nothing. But you asked for the double portion. You said you wanted it. You said you were ready for it. Are we ready for it? Who says, I want the double portion? See, we got to stop being loose at the mouth and just, you know, making vows and commitments and saying this and that. And then it comes time to pay up, and we can't pay up. We can't. Oh, God, I didn't know singing that song at the altar was me making a commitment to you. I didn't know lifting my hand saying I surrender all. I didn't know saying if you could use me, you could use anything that you were actually going to show up and you want to use me. I just thought I looked cute in that outfit, and I wanted to be at the altar, and I wanted everybody to see it that day. That's all. You know, Hannah didn't live in the realm of the flesh. No great woman lives in that realm. No relentless woman lives in the flesh. No relentless woman no conquering woman, no soldier, no warrior woman ever lives in the flesh. It don't mean we don't get in the flesh every once in a while. It means I press through it. It means, okay, this happened, but you know what? I'm not going to go out like that. I've come too far. I'm not going down like that. God's done too much. That means i got to humble myself. If i got to be the one to be quiet, if i got to be the one to say I'm sorry, if i got to be the one to just, just push through, then that's what I'm going to do. But no relentless woman, no great woman of God lives in the flesh. That's why women that are in the flesh and women that are living in the land of prayer and supplication, they don't agree on anything. Because you don't see the same thing. I don't see what you see. You see a God that threw you in the valley and left you there. I see a God that put me in the valley to make me stronger so that when I start climbing the mountain, I'm going to make it all the way to the top. It's all about our perspective. See, Penna not thought she was going to mess with Hannah and, and humiliate her and, and provoke her and irritate her. And she thought that Hannah was going to respond out of the situation that she was in. But she didn't. She didn't respond to Penna. Instead, she cried out to God. And that's what we need to do. You know that Hannah did something very special. And when you read the scripture very carefully... It changes your perspective on making vows to God. My third point is that Hannah vowed a vow. I hope you're following me tonight. Hannah vowed a vow. At this point, you know that her husband, he didn't even understand her. 
Look at what the word of God says in chapter 1, verse 8. So Elkanah asked Hannah, why are you crying? Why won't you eat? Why do you feel so bad? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Her husband, he doesn't understand what's happening. And you want to know why? Because it was between her and God. Your husband, your mama, your kids, your dog named Spot, ain't nobody going to understand what you're going through. Because it's between you and God. It's a matter that's between you and your father. Because he says, I don't understand. Why are you crying? Haven't I been good to you, Hannah? Haven't I loved you? Why do you feel so bad? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons, Hannah? You know that the number ten was a number of completion and fulfillment. That's why he said ten sons. He said, don't I complete you? Don't I fulfill you, Hannah? No. No, you don't, Elkanah. You're my husband. And you meet certain needs in me as my husband, as my leader, as the priest in my home. But you don't complete me. And you don't fulfill me. Not even if right now I had ten sons, not even that would fulfill me. It wasn't about the number of children that she was going to have or not have. It was about her becoming fulfilled and complete by God and God alone. And that's what he wants to do inside of us. Let God be everything. Let him be the one that completes and fulfills you. Elkanah felt like, am I not enough for you? I favor you. I love you. Do I not fulfill you, Hannah? And it wasn't any of this. Hannah loved her husband. And he completed her and fulfilled her to his capacity people around you they're limited they can only fulfill you to their capacity they can only complete you to a certain place they're not God they can't take you all the way they can't complete you and fulfill you like he alone can see she needed fulfillment and completion from the Lord and until we get to that place we'll never go to the next level and I'm talking from leaders to the girl that just walked in tonight until we let God be our everything we will not ever be completed or fulfilled it wasn't about anything else. He thought it was about Hannah wanting a child. You know, it was never about her wanting a child. It was about the fact that God had called her to have that child. See, there's a difference. Oh, she just wanted a child. No. See, she knew she had a promise from God. That's the difference. Have you forgotten about the promise from God? Did you get so focused on the promise that you forgot who gave you the promise? See, she didn't forget. It wasn't about the child. It was about that God said he would give her the child. It's not about the healing. It's that you're the healer and you said you would heal my body. It's not about that I'm in a desolate place. No, it's about that you said you're the God of more than enough and that you would take me out of this. It was never about the child. It was about the, God, the fact that God said he would give her a child. It's not about what your carnal eye sees. It's not about what's in front of you. It's about who promised it to you. And we get so focused on the promise, we forget who gave the promise. We get focused on the promise and we lose sight of the one that gave it. You know, she was her husband's favorite. But you know that because she was, she grieved all the more because she had no part in the coming generations. She wasn't oh, boo-hoo, because I can't have a baby, and Penanah has ten sons and daughters. She was thinking about the future. She was thinking about the vision. See, her, her cry was that, man, how am I going to contribute to the future generations? See, and that should be the cry within you and me. Man, how can I contribute for the future of our ministry, for the future generations that are yet to come through my life? That should be the cry within inside of us. But instead, we get caught up with, well, what about me? And you said, and, you know, I thought this was going to happen, and that was going to happen. And, you know, we're doing our little list. We ever do that with God? We come to prayer with our big checklist about everything he hasn't done. 
oh, but you still haven't done this. And you still haven't done that. And you still haven't done that. And God is saying, man, I'm still waiting for you just to get on your knees and really righteously pray to me. I'm just waiting for the one day you're going to show up without your big checklist and just praise me because I'm God and I saved you. And that should be alone enough all by itself. I'm still waiting for that. I believe that we come sometimes with this certain attitude. You know that Hannah's environment was not conducive to prayer or to, you know, she, she didn't have, it was not an, uh, an environment of having great dreams. She was barren. She couldn't have children in a time when you were looked at like being cursed, being the outcast. You know how women are. Women talk. And they get come out of their little tent, and they would talk about Hannah. Oh, they're, oh, look at Penanah's having another one, and Hannah still don't have no children. Hannah still barren. I wonder how she offended God. I wonder what. Oh, she got have sin in her life because there's no babies coming out of her tent, huh? Women can destroy each other. Women can kill each other off. They will kill each other off with their words. Instead of gathering together and saying, man, if I know the joy of childbearing, I can only imagine the sorrow of being barren. Let's get around Hannah and let's encourage her. Let's pray for her. Let's believe God with her. Nobody did that for Hannah. Nobody came to her tent and said, Hannah, you want to go up to the house of the Lord and pray? Hannah, you know the God that we serve. He's a miracle working God. He opened up the Red Sea. He fed our ancestors with, you know, manna from heaven. Come on, Hannah, let's go pray. Nobody did that for Hannah. I believe there's Hannah's in the church, and they're in their tents alone weeping, and they're fighting a battle all alone because Peninnah's too busy just talking about Hannah and trying to destroy Hannah. I believe Peninnah is a spirit. It's a spirit that creeps into the church. It's a spirit of I want what somebody else has. The spirit of Penina coming in between sisters, coming in between mothers and daughters, coming in between spiritual mamas and their children, causing havoc. Penina is a spirit, and it comes in to destroy the spirit of Hannah that's humble, that's a fighter, that doesn't need to be recognized, that's the background worker, that's the faithful tither. Even when she don't got to give, she's going to give. We got to be careful that we're not falling under the curse and the spell of the spirit of Penina, that we are being like the women, like Hannah, women of prayer, women of humility, women that say, but God, you said... And because you said all the pen and off can rise up against me. You know that she, she was in a country that was, at this time, it was a spiritual decline. But it didn't deter her. Aren't we on a spiritual decline in our country? I mean, come on. Do I need to go there tonight about all the stuff that's going on? You know, a lot of preachers don't want to preach about heaven and hell no more because they're going to offend somebody. Man, let me offend you all the way to heaven then. Because if you don't give your life to Jesus, guess what? <laughs> there is a real place called hell. And that's where if we don't serve the Lord and we fall from the things of God, we cannot preach pretty little messages just to make people feel good. Jesus didn't come and make people feel good. He flipped tables over. He got mad. He got upset. When the house of God was not being a house of prayer, like what he called it to be. We want to be like, you know, just looking good on the outside. No, we cannot offend somebody already. My God, it's okay. Jesus is coming back. I said, Jesus is coming back. No man knows the hour. The Bible says he's going to come like a thief in the night. And my God, woe to us that have, we're afraid to preach heaven and hell. That we're afraid to preach about the second coming. Penina is a spirit. It's a spirit. <clears throat> this spirit will try to come and try to grieve you, destroy you. Cause you to take your eyes off the master. Am I talking to somebody tonight? Huh? Have you been on your knees crying out, saying, God, when, how, who, and where? And then there's Penanah knocking at your door. 
and you're like, oh, there she is. Oh, my God. Father, the blood of Jesus, Lord, protect my mind, protect my heart, protect my integrity, protect my character, protect my mouth. Help me, Lord. Give me the strength to be the woman you call me to be. I don't got to act like Pen and I. I don't got to talk like her. I don't got to look like her. I don't got to treat others like she does. It's a spirit. It's a spirit that will want to come in. Pen and I will tell you not to give. Pen and I will tell you don't fulfill your pledge. Pen and I will tell you don't have faith. What's faith going to do for you? Your husband's still not serving God. Oh, what's faith going to do for you? Your son's in prison serving a life sentence. What has faith done for you? That's the spirit of Pen and ah. But Hannah, the spirit of Hannah gets on her knees. The spirit of Hannah says, no, but see, my God said, I don't go by sight. Faith isn't by what I see or what I feel. Faith is that I, I believe that my God said, and because my God said it's going to happen, it might not even happen in my lifetime, but I will go to the grave believing that it's going to happen because God said it would happen. Like the songs, as long as I have breath, as long as I have breath. And that's what Hannah did. She didn't let her environment, she didn't let the fact that her country was in a spiritual decline, she didn't detour from what God had told her. See, God was the creator of children, and she knew that. And only God could convert her from a woman to a mother. Only God could do that. Only God can change the situation. Only God, only God can turn it around. I can't turn it around for you. You can't turn it around for yourself. Only God. Now listen to this. The Bible says in verse 11, it says, And she vowed a vow and said, O Jehovah of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of, my, of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto Jehovah all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. It says that she vowed a vow. Now that stood out to me because normally we don't hear that. We make vows. We usually make vows. Have you ever said, I vow a vow? I never have. When I read it, it stood out to me. And I, I, I really started get digging in there. What did, what did she mean, God? Why did she vow a vow? Why not just make a vow? She wasn't in an ordinary situation. And she couldn't just make a vow. Because that wasn't sufficient. She had to vow a vow. The words she vowed a vow means that she promised in a positive and concrete manner to give something to God. It meant she was committing to give God what or whomever he gave to her. I vow a vow. So if you give me a man child, she specifically said, if you give me a son, I vow a vow to give him back to you. My promise is concrete. I am positive that I will give him back to you. See, we don't vow vows anymore because we, we make vows because then in case we want to keep what God's given us, like our husbands when they're called to take a city and we want to keep them because now they got a good job and they buy you all the nice little pretty things that you like. Oh, I know someone here is not going to like me after this service, but that's okay because Jesus loves me and I just got to tell you the truth tonight. Oh, God, give me a pastor. And now he's giving you that man of God, and now you don't want to give him back. Oh, give me a child, and I'll give him back. And God gave you a child, and that child's still in your house, and you don't want to release him because he's your child. Oh, God, give me a job, and I'll pay tithes. I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> oh, I make a God, if you give me a raise at work, I will make a pledge. And God gave you a raise, and there ain't no pledge with your name on it. Hannah said, 
I'm going to vow a vow. I'm going to make sure that I don't go back on my word. I'm going to make sure that even against me, <laughs> I will not. So God, I vow a vow that if you give me a son, I'm going to give him back to you. You know, by her saying, I vow a vow, she was extending her vow unto the Lord. Listen, she was dedicating what she didn't even have yet. We can't even dedicate what we possess. Oh, my God. She was dedicating what she didn't even have yet. She said, man, I know the God I serve. I'm praying for a son. Penny, now I ain't gone through everything you put me through for nothing. I'm getting a son out of this, girl. Oh, you put me through some things, Penny, now. You've talked about me. You've even stepped on me a few times. Oh, but I'm going to get up, and when I get up, I'm going to get up strong. I've paid a price for this son, and I'm going to have me my son. But when I do, I'm not going to be like you and keep them all in my tent waiting for my little portion of me. I'm going to give my son back to the Lord, back to the Lord. She vowed a vow. She extended. She was dedicating what she didn't even have to the house of the Lord by specifically dedicating him to serve as a priest in the house of the Lord. She didn't stop there. Remember, she vowed a vow, meaning she extended her vow. You know that the Levitical age of retirement, in other words, the age that a priest could retire was the age 50, but she went beyond that. The language that she used, I, Hannah, vow a vow, meant complete surrender of the child for Levitical service for his entire life. It meant that the vow of his uncut hair was a sign that he would be consecrated to God all the days of his life. She didn't just say, I'm going to just make a little vow just to get through this. I'm in a storm, so God, if you get me out of this, I vow to do this. I vow to do that. I look at those words differently now. Are we women that just make vows, or are we women that will say, I'm going to vow a vow? Because we make vows, but they come with time limits and boundaries, and, and, they, and we limit but she vowed a vow that was for an eternal life, a vow that would continuously cost her. It was the vow of the double portion. That vow, that I vow a vow, was going to continuously cost her. And that's why women today don't want to vow vows. They want to just make a vow. I pray that tonight in this sanctuary, there are women in this place tonight that say, you know what, I, I'm done just making vows. I'm done putting limits on my vows to God. I'm done putting boundaries on my vow to God. I'm done. Tonight, as we bring this message to an end, I want you to think about it. I want you for a moment just to think I don't know what sermon you were expecting or goosebumps or jumping out of your seat. I needed to bring you this word, this very serious word, because God is looking for a group of women that will fall under the conduct of his spirit. He's looking for a group of women that aren't going to put a time limit on God that aren't going to say, well, God, if you give me this, I'll give them back, but only for a season. I commit my life at this level, but only for a season. I commit, but only for a season. I'll give you, but you got to give it back. Women that vow a vow because they know it's going to cost them, and they're okay with paying the price. Are you okay with paying the price? Don't answer me. I I'm nobody. Answer him. Are you okay with saying, I vow a vow? I don't want to fall under that spirit of Peninnah. I don't want to fall under the spirit of Hannah. I don't want to be that woman that says, 
These are my children. What do you mean you want them, Lord? And the Lord is saying, yeah, didn't I give them to you? I went into the women's home, like I said, facing 25 to life. I was a young girl, started selling drugs at the age of 14, had my apartment, had things. 19, walking the streets with no shoes on, didn't remember my name. I was in a mental institution. They said I was schizophrenic, paranoid, and multiple personalities. I had a three-month-old baby, didn't even know his name. So when Jesus came into this wretched woman's life, and he asked me, will you just make a vow or will you vow a vow? They belong to you, Lord. My life isn't even mine. And I don't say that like I'm somebody great. I say it like whatever little I have, whatever little that I am, whatever little bit I can give you, then I vow a vow that it's yours. I want you to stand with me tonight.